Welcome to this program in the Our Finger Lakes History Series. I am Seneca County historian Walter Gable. This program deals with the trial of Susan B. Anthony in 1873. The trial arose because Susan B. Anthony voted in the federal or national elections in November 1872, even though by New York state law at the time, women were specifically prohibited from voting. The trial took place in the courtroom in the Ontario County Courthouse in Canandaigua, New York, making it one of the most important legal events ever to take place in the Finger Lakes region. This trial helped make women's suffrage a prominent national issue and raised significant constitutional issues. Shown here are some famous quotes made by Susan B. Anthony in her decades of striving for women's suffrage. In the top right, quote, is actually from what she said on the second day of her trial, but you will see much more about this later. The quote at the bottom is another famous quote associated with Miss Anthony. Shown with the headshot of Susan B. Anthony is the famous comment she made in her last public address before her death, the famous phrase, failure is impossible. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony had begun working together soon after they formally met each other in May of 1851 in Seneca Falls, New York. They spent much of the rest of their lives struggling to achieve women's suffrage. Tragically, neither lived to see women's suffrage become reality in New York State, let alone the entire United States. Susan B. Anthony had been planning to vote for three years prior to her actions in 1872. She wanted to create a court case which she and her supporters could appeal all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In other words, she wanted to create what is commonly called a test case. She was hoping that when she attempted to vote in a federal election and was denied the right to vote, that she could then appeal that denial to the U.S. Supreme Court forcing the U.S. Supreme Court to make a ruling on whether the wording of the recently adopted 14th Amendment actually gave women who were U.S. citizens the right to vote. Hopefully, you who are viewing this video remember one or both of the test cases that are shown in the lower right of this frame. The 1886 separate but equal ruling in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, or more likely the Brown versus Topeka ruling in 1954 that separate is inherently unequal, a ruling that began the process of ending racial segregation in public schools. Well, Anthony wanted to create a test case that she hoped would lead to a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that the wording of the 14th Amendment did guarantee women who were U.S. citizens the right to vote. This idea of a test case is the basis of this program. In a very quick history lesson, at the end of the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were added to the U.S. Constitution. Simply stated, the intent of these amendments was the 13th abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment made the former slave citizens, and then the 15th Amendment was intended to guarantee that freed black males would have the right to vote. Shown here is the wording of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. Woman suffrage, not just, excuse me, women suffrage advocates, not just Susan B. Anthony, felt that the wording of this part of the 14th Amendment, because it didn't say only men, this wording could then be interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court to mean that men 
had the right to vote, but yes, women also had the right to vote because they were citizens of the United States and the state in which they resided. Hence the desire of Anthony to have a test case to go to the Supreme Court. Susan B. Anthony's voting in 1872 was not the first attempt by women suffrage advocates to vote. Here you see that there were attempts, but what Susan B. Anthony did in the federal election in November 1872 is the first such actual casting of ballots. Of course, I'm also showing that women were allowed to vote in the Wyoming Territory and the Utah Territory, but they couldn't vote in the 1872 federal elections because Wyoming and Utah were territories, not states. Also, we have a female candidate for president on the Equal Rights Party ticket in 1872. The woman candidate for president is Victoria Woodhull. Anthony had been organizing about 50 women in Rochester to attempt to register to vote so as to create her planned test case when she and these other ladies were denied their claimed right to register to vote. Along with her three sisters, Susan went to her election district number one in the 8th Ward of Rochester on the last registration day to try to register to vote. As the Anthony sisters entered the barbershop in the West End News Depot on West Main Street, they found three young men serving as voter registrars. The three young men were Edward T. Marsh, Beverly Jones, and William B. Hall. Susan walked directly up to these three voter registrars, and as one of the registrars later testified, she, quote, demanded that we re register them as voters. As this illustration suggests, the three voter registrars were rather surprised and confused by Anthony's demand. This illustration of these three voter registrars appeared in the book Heart on Fire. When the three registrars didn't immediately let Anthony register to vote, she persisted with her demand to be allowed to register to vote. Anthony said that the 14th Amendment made it clear women were citizens. She also argued that the New York State Constitution section on voting did not spell out any sex qualification for voting. She went on to state, almost as a threat, that she had sufficient legal backing from Judge Henry Selden and other lawyers who would represent her and financial backing to go after these registrars if necessary. The election inspectors weren't convinced, but they consulted with Daniel Warner, the supervisor of elections. Warner said the registrars could be charged with unlawful re refusal to register a voter. So Warner advised those three registrars, let Anthony register to vote then the legal onus is on her. Anthony proceeded and registered to vote. She said all of this took about one hour. One of the newspapers in the city of Rochester, namely the Rochester Daily Union and Advertiser, editorialized strongly in opposition to having allowed these women to register to vote. As you can see in this editorial excerpt, that the paper was arguing that if the women actually proceeded to vote on election day, which was the next day, these ladies should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The newspaper also called for the arrest of the voting inspectors who had complied with the women's demands to register to vote. Well. Anthony voted. Anthony's voting on election day received wide coverage in newspapers. Shown here is a clipping of the article that appeared the next day in the New York Times. 
I have enlarged the first two sentences so that they can be read more easily. Miss Anthony and eight other ladies actually voted in her election district that Tuesday, November 5th, 1872. A total of 15 ladies, including Anthony, actually voted in all of the districts of Rochester that day. Anthony's attempt to vote was challenged by a poll watcher named Sylvester Lewis. The three election inspectors at Anthony's voting place voted two to one to allow Anthony to take her oath, fold her ballot so that one of the inspectors could then deposit it in a ballot box. Anthony had expected not to be allowed to vote and that would be the basis for her test case to take to the U.S. Supreme Court. Much to her surprise, perhaps, she was allowed to vote. Now the question was, what repercussions, if any, would there be for Anthony and the other ladies who actually voted? Today, the barber shop in the West End News Depot where Anthony voted no longer stands. In 2009, the site became known as the 1872 Monument. There are two pillars that represent the barbershop's storefront. In the center, there is a bronze sculpture of a locked ballot box. Leading away from the 1872 Monument is Susan B. Anthony Trail, which leads to Troop Street Park. Getting back to the real history here, later on election day, Anthony wrote to her dear friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Shown at bottom left is a copy of the actual letter that Anthony wrote. In the excerpt shown at right, I have highlighted certain wording in bold print. The first bold black text says, while I have been and gone and done it meaning that she had voted as the woman suffragists had been plotting for Anthony to do. Anthony goes on to say that she proudly voted a straight Republican ticket because the Republican Party had promised to give the demands of women a respectful hearing. In the last part of the quote, she alludes that her illegal voting was setting up a test case in which the Supreme Court would hopefully rule that wording of the 14th Amendment meant women as well as men who were citizens could vote. In the middle of the text excerpt, I have highlighted in red ink Anthony's comment that she was confident that her voting was going to stir things up in Rochester. How ominous a comment it was. It took only a few days for her prediction of a fine agitation on the question to become reality. Sylvester Lewis, a poll watcher where Anthony had voted, had challenged her attempt to vote. The election inspectors allowed her to vote, but Lewis then filed a formal complaint with William Storrs, the U.S. Commissioner and Officer of the Federal Courts in Rochester. On November 15th, Commissioner Storrs issued warrants for the arrest of Miss Anthony and the 14 other ladies who voted. The arrest warrants claimed that the ladies had voted for members of the U.S. House of Representatives, quote, without having a legal right to vote, unquote in violation of Section 19 of the Federal Enforcement Act of 1870. As shown here on November 18th, a deputy federal marshal went to Anthony's home to arrest her. Anthony demanded that she be arrested in the normal way, putting out her hands. One account says that she then demanded that she be handcuffed. The deputy marshal took her on the street, street, city streetcar to the commissioner's office. 
On the way, Anthony learned that the deputy had to pay the street care car fare for any criminal arrested. Anthony then remarked, well, that's the first cents worth I've ever had from Uncle Sam. At Commissioner Storr's office, she found Henry Selden, her chief lawyer, and John Pound, an assistant U.S. attorney. Anthony learned that the 14 other ladies who had voted were also being arrested, as well as the three election inspectors. Pound asked for Anthony's plea, and Selden refused to enter a plea before an indictment. As shown here, the local newspaper carried the story. You will note that the text begins with the statement that Anthony is pleased her case is going to the courts. The Syracuse Courier reported her arrest under the headline, Crime in Rochester. In this slide and one more, I want to cover the legal steps leading to Anthony's trial for allegedly illegal voting. At a preliminary hearing November 29th, Anthony said she never doubted her right to vote. So Commissioner Storrs continued the hearing and finally ruled that Anthony and the 14 other ladies who voted and were arrested must give bail. The 14 other ladies posted their bail. Anthony refused. Anthony is ordered, held in custody of a federal marshal until a grand jury could continue, could consider indicting Anthony. That poor federal marshal could hardly keep up with Anthony as she continued with her speaking engagements she had already scheduled in various places in support of women's suffrage. Anthony's lawyer petitioned the district court for a writ of habeas corpus, alleging Anthony was not rightfully being held in custody. Continuing on, January 21st, 1873, in Federal District Court in Albany, Judge Hall denied Anthony's request to be released from custody. He increased her bail to $1,000, and she refused to pay. She was shocked to learn that unbeknownst to her, her lawyer, Henry Selden, went ahead and paid her bail. When she learned this from Anthony's other lawyer, she confronted Selden about this. Selden said he posted the bail because he could not consider a lady he respected put in jail. On January 24, 1873, a grand jury formally indicted Anthony and the 14 other Rochester ladies who had voted, charging them, quote, knowingly, wrongfully, and unlawfully voting. The key wording of the indictment is highlighted in red. A picture of the actual indictment is shown at right. The indictment meant that Anthony would now proceed to trial. Prior to her scheduled trial in Rochester, Anthony in March and April of 1873 spoke in 29 villages and towns in Monroe County. She spoke on the question shown here, is it a crime for a citizen of the United States to vote? Anthony said she committed no crime, but instead simply exercised her right as a citizen of the United States. You can easily realize that this extensive speaking tour throughout Monroe County could prejudice any prospective juror for Anthony's upcoming trial. Anthony was probably feeling pretty confident that she had convinced potential jurists throughout Monroe County about her argument that she had the right to vote. In April, however, came two U.S. Supreme Court rulings that would likely affect her case. 
I won't go into the details of those cases, but those rulings clearly limited the use of the 14th Amendment wording to give women the right to vote, according to the U.S. Supreme Court. On May 22nd, Anthony's 14 co-defendants were arraigned. They pleaded guilty. They were released on their own recognizance pending the outcome of Anthony's trial. It is clear that Anthony was being singled out for a public trial. That same day, U.S. Attorney Crowley asked that Anthony's trial be held in the Ontario County Courthouse. Crowley apparently realized that Anthony speaking to her had prejudiced potential jurists in Monroe County. Crowley had the right to request such a change in venue, but it meant that the trial in Canandaigua would, would be held with Judge Ward Hunt presiding. The significance of Judge Hunt presiding is something that I will cover shortly. With her trial moved to Canandaigua in Ontario County, Miss Anthony set up a speaking schedule in Ontario County like what she had done in Monroe County. Realizing she couldn't speak in every village in Hamlet in Ontario County all by herself in the limited time available before the trial, she enlisted the help of her dear suffragist friend, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Shown up at right is the typed text of a Geneva Daily Gazette newspaper article about this speaking schedule to convince people throughout the county of Ontario that it was not a crime for a woman to vote simply because women are citizens. At upper left, I have enlarged the portion that lists Miss Anthony's speaking schedule. At bottom is the speaking schedule of Mrs. Gage. Imagine virtually every day for about six weeks, you are speaking in another place to another crowd. Even though you are basically saying the same words each day, it must have become a very tiring ordeal. At a time when there were no radios, let alone television and not even telephones, the news media were sp newspaper media were spreading news throughout the United States about the upcoming Anthony trial. Some reports were neutral, some were supportive of what Anthony was trying to achieve, but some reports were very critical. Shown is one such critical one. The satirical portion of Susan B. Anthony reveals fears about changing gender rules. You will note that Susan B. Anthony has a rather stern facial appearance that she's wearing an Uncle Sam hat. In the background, men are doing the child care, a woman is dressed as a male policeman, and women are rallying for their rights. This political cartoon represented the feelings of a large portion of the male population that feared that Anthony was trying to alter the traditional roles of men and women in U.S. society. With the change in venue to the Canandaigua Courthouse for the trial, the tr presiding judge at Anthony's tr trial was Judge Ward Hunt. Ward Hunt had been appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court only a few months earlier. At that time, the practice was that members of the U.S. Supreme Court would preside at federal district court cases held in the particular circuit court area to which each justice was assigned. Having the Anthony trial take place before an associate justice of the U.S. Supreme Court would give Anthony's trial added significance. The problem, however, was that Hunt had been appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court at the rather strong arm urging of 
Roscoe Conkling, a Republican power boss who was an avowed enemy of woman suffrage. When U.S. Attorney Crowley requested the change in venue for Anthony's trial to the Federal Circuit Court in Ontario County, Crowley had to feel pretty confident that Hunt would not allow Anthony to be found not guilty. Crowley knew that Hunt was a friend and crony of Roscoe Conklin, so Hunt had to be opposed to woman suffrage. Shown here are the key lawyers in the Anthony trial. The two at the left were Anthony's lawyers, Henry Selden and his co-defense lawyer, John Van Voorhis. At right it is Richard Crowley, who was the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of New York. He is the prosecuting attorney. This is the Ontario County Courthouse in Canandaigua, New York, as it looks today. Anthony's trial was held there. The courthouse and much of the interior very much still in use yet today. This is the North Courtroom on the second floor. It was in this courtroom that the Anthony trial took place. For you Hamilton musical fans, this is the room where it happens. A large audience attended. The audience included former U.S. President Millard Fillmore. An ambitious 1987-88 renovation restored the grand courtroom to its late 19th century appearance. Its walls bear numerous portraits of influential ju judges and community leaders and a portrait of Susan B. Anthony. This is the portrait of Susan B. Anthony. The portrait apparently shows Anthony at a slighter, younger age than she was at her trial. When she tried, she was 53 years old. Its prominent display today in the courtroom, along with those other portraits, demonstrates the sense of historic importance, the Anthony trial that took place in that courtroom. In the hall just outside the entrance to this courtroom is this sculpture of Susan B. Anthony. The wording of the inscription at the base is enlarged at right. Notice that it emphasizes justice denied here in her trial, as we will see as we continue. The trial itself began June 17, 1873. Jury members were selected and seated. The prosecuting attorney made his brief opening statement that Anthony was a woman and thus voted illegally because no state allowed women to vote. That was to be the main argument of the prosecution. The prosecution had an election inspector testify that Anthony had voted. This established that Anthony had done what was considered illegally, namely voting in a federal election. Henry Selden, the chief defense attorney, testified that he had been consulted by Anthony as to her legal opinion if she had the right to vote. He said she did. Selden then tried to call Anthony as a witness, but Judge Hunt denied this request. At that time, courts did not allow women to testify, even in their own trial. The other main happening that first day is that Selden argued that Anthony was being prosecuted simply because of her gender. Each day of the trial was widely reported in newspapers throughout the country. At left is an article from a Michigan newspaper. At right is the front page article of the New York Times. 
It appeared that the first day of the trial had basically established that Anthony, as a woman, had voted illegally. In the second day of the trial, U.S. Attorney Crowley summed up that main argument of the federal government and added that in those two recent Supreme Court cases covered earlier in this program, it had become clear that the 14th and 15th Amendments should not be used to give women the right to vote. When it came time for presiding Judge Hunt to charge the jury before the jury began deliberations, instead of charging the jury, Judge Hunt pulled from his pocket a paper and began to read from it. In what was clearly a prepared statement, Judge Hunt said that states determined who could vote, the 14th Amendment did not give women the right to vote, even though they were citizens. He then concluded by, in effect, saying Anthony was guilty. There was no need for the jury to deliberate. That night, Anthony reflected her thoughts in her diary. She called Judge Hunt's directing a guilty verdict without the jury deliberating to be, quote, the greatest judicial outrage history has ever recorded. Anthony was well aware that the Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guaranteed the right to a trial by jury for a person accused of a crime. Anthony was convinced that Judge Selden had written his prepared statement of a directed verdict of guilty before the trial had even begun. As we saw in the previous frames, Anthony was very upset about what Judge Hunt had done in this second day of the trial. At the start of the third day of the trial, defense lawyer Henry Selden was still incensed himself. Selden made a motion for a retrial, claiming that Miss Anthony's Sixth Amendment right to a trial by jury in a criminal case had been violated, but Judge Hunt denied the motion. Selden then asked the judge poll the jury, but Judge Hunt denied that request. Historians have pointed out that Selden sensed that there were some jurists who would not have found guilty Anthony guilty if the jury members had been individually polled. The main thing left in Anthony's trial was for Judge Hunt to pronounce her sentence. Before pronouncing her sentence, he followed the normal practice of asking the defendant if she had anything to say why sentencing should not be pronounced. That gave Anthony the opportunity to talk and she took advantage of this opportunity. Anthony was given a chance to speak, and did she ever take advantage of the opportunity? She began by saying, quote, Yes, Your Honor, I have something to say, for in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. Judge Hunt tried to stop her from talking, but Anthony kept talking. She said it was the first time that either she or any other woman had been allowed a word of defense before judge or jury. Again, Judge Hunt interrupted, saying, quote, The prisoner must sit down. The court cannot allow it. But Anthony kept talking. Judge Hunt was unable to stop Anthony from talking until she decided she was finished and sat down. Judge Hunt then had her stand up again so he could pronounce her sentence. The sentence was a fine of $100 and pay the costs of the prosecution. Anthony replied she would, quote, never pay the costs of, the, of your unjust penalty. Anthony, excuse me, she would never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty. Anthony went on to say that she still had a debt of $10,000 from her publication of the women's rights paper called The Revolution. 
and she said that she would continue to work to pay off that newspaper debt, but she wouldn't work to pay off that unjust fine. When Anthony refused to pay her fine, Judge Hunt didn't follow the normal procedure of putting Anthony in jail. The failure to put her in jail deprived Anthony of another opportunity to go to, to appeal her case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Anthony and her legal advisors had first planned for a test case to go to the U.S. Supreme Court for her being denied the right to register to vote. When the election inspectors let her register to vote and actually vote, Anthony and her legal advisors were arrested for allegedly illegally voting and then for being jailed for her refusal to pay the fine imposed. Now that would be a test case, but Judge Hunt denied her that test case. Judge Hunt had probably been given legal advice that is not putting Anthony in jail was the right thing to do if you didn't want her trial to become a test case to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Following Anthony's trial, the three election inspectors were tried that same day for having allowed Anthony and the other ladies to register to vote and actually vote. Those three election inspectors were found guilty by the jury. Yes, Judge Hunt let the verdict for the three election inspectors be decided by the jury. Judge Hunt sentenced each election inspector to a $25 fine. They refused to pay, and Hunt ordered them to jail. As I had suggested or previously, the Anthony trial received nationwide coverage in the newspapers. Here is one newspaper article on her sentencing. Notice how the headline merely said, Susan, since everyone throughout the country virtually knew who that Susan was. Following Anthony's trial, there was much newspaper speculation as to whether Judge Hunt had been wrong in directing a verdict of guilty without allowing the jury to deliberate. Wasn't his action a violation of the Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution? As you can see, the New York Sun, as well as some other newspapers, called for Judge Hunt to be impeached. The other 14 ladies who had been arrested and indicted for illegally voting were told that they would not have to attend Anthony's trial. Following Anthony's trial, the U.S. attorney entered a motion saying that the federal government would not pursue any prosecution of these 14 other ladies. Clearly, once more, Anthony has been singled out by the federal government for prosecution. Note at the bottom of this frame that these women activists in May 1873, a month prior to Anthony's trial, formed the Women's Taxpayer Association of Monroe County to protest that women were being taxed without representation simply because they couldn't vote. In January 1874, Anthony petitioned Congress for a remission of her fine because of the unjust character of her trial. Her supporters in Congress got her petition introduced in the Judiciary Committee of both houses of Congress. The House of Representatives failed to take action. No further action on her petition was taken by Congress. The three convicted election inspectors didn't pay their fine and they were put in jail finally in late February 1874. Many Rochester ladies brought home-cooked meals to these jailed election inspectors while they were in jail. Susan B. Anthony contacted her Republican friends in Congress to put pressure on U.S. President Grant to pardon these election inspectors. President Grant pardoned the three election inspectors on March 3, 1874. That same day that Grant pardoned them, in the elections held in Rochester, 
those three men were reelected to their election jobs. Anthony saw that getting out the full details of her trial would help the woman's suffrage cause greatly. She had 3,000 copies of the trial proceedings printed and distributed these copies to political activists and libraries throughout the United States. As an introduction to her trial proceedings, Anthony had John Hooker write an essay in which Hooker said that Judge Hunt's actions, quote, were contrary to all rules of law, unquote, and were, quote, subversive of the system of jury trials in criminal courts. So you can see Anthony had a purpose in disseminating cases of the proceedings of her trial. There was valid reason for criticism of Judge Hunt's actions in the Susan B. Anthony trial. The Albany Law Journal, the most prestigious law journal in the United States, in summer 1874, criticized Hunt's actions in the Anthony trial. Shortly after Judge Hunt retired from the U.S. Supreme Court in 1882, a U.S. Circuit Court judge ruled that it was wrong for a judge to direct a jury to deliver a verdict of guilty. Finally, in 1895, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a federal judge could not direct a jury to return a guilty verdict in a criminal trial. In other words, it had to go to the jury for deliberation. In effect, Judge Hunt's prejudiced actions in Anthony's trial would not have been allowed if Anthony's trial had occurred after this 1895 Supreme Court case. So a big question is, who actually ended up winning in this Susan B. Anthony trial held in the courthouse in Canandaigua, New York? Judge Hunt's heavy-handed actions were criticized and in effect ruled wrong in a Supreme Court ruling after he retired from the Supreme Court. Anthony was fined but refused to pay the fine and the federal government didn't put her in jail and she never paid the fine. The other 14 ladies who voted were not tried. The three election inspectors who let Anthony and other ladies register to vote and then actually vote, they were pardoned and they were reelected to their election positions. The publicity of the Anthony trial made woman suffrage a major issue nationwide. This Washington County Post newspaper editorial states it so well. If it is a mere question of who got the best of it, Miss Anthony is still alive. She has voted and the American Constitution has survived the shock. Fining her $100 does not rule out the fact women voted and went home and the world jogged on as before. It has become a tradition in recent years for a few Rochester to people to vote and go to Anthony's grave in Mount Hope Cemetery and place an I voted sticker or a flower on her grave. A few years after Anthony's death and 47 years after her trial in Canandaigua, the 19th Amendment guaranteed woman suffrage everywhere in the United States. A trial that happened here in the Finger Lakes of nationwide significance. I hope you have enjoyed this piece in our Finger Lakes history.